This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I said we had uh, senior scholars and not so senior scholars and some PhD students. And now we have Joe Mulhern, who's uh, a PhD student at the University of Liverpool, uh, linked to the uh, British Library. And he's been, he did his uh, MA at King, in the Brazil Institute at King's College, he's a student of ours, and he's uh, doing a very interesting work, I think, on British, British companies in Brazil uh, who ended up with slaves uh, in one way or another. And how did they deal with the fact that the framework was powerful British anti-slavery, the official mind, the official policy was anti-slavery in Brazil after the ending of the slave trade. Uh, but some of these companies uh, ended up actually owning or working with slaves. And he's taken, he's got one or two examples of this, and he's going to take one, I think, this morning, unless you've changed your mind. No, 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 still the same case study. Um, well, thanks for that introduction, Leslie. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Linda and Alan, who I've known for a while in a, a previous capacity, my work at uh, Canning House. So it's nice to be on this side of the fence, and uh, I'm brand new to this, so I hope it goes well. My paper, British Enterprise, Anti-Slavery Identity and Labour in Brazil, is a presentation of some recent research related to the administration of a large coffee plantation by a British bank during the transition from slave to free labour in Brazil. I'll show that despite an initial commitment to free labour, the London and Brazilian bank's adherence to British anti-slavery identity was ultimately left wanting as it attempted to operate profitably in an economy whose most dynamic sectors was still dominated by slavery. And I think I've got a little bit extra time today, so I'd like at the end to introduce some, some ideas um, from ongoing research beyond the Angelica Plantation to show how this bank, um, some of its other business practices, continue to contradict British anti-slavery identity and indeed foreign policy right up until the abolition of slavery in Brazil in 1888. As Leslie mentioned, this case study is part of my wider doctoral project which seeks to explore the dissonance between, on the one hand, Britain's historical and continued anti-slavery role in Brazil and elsewhere, and on the other, the entanglement of its expanding financial and commercial interests with Brazilian slavery, particularly in the post-1850s context. By focusing on other sectors of British activity, uh, banking in this case, the aim is to expand on the important work on the extractive industries by the likes of Childs, Eakins, Evans and Libby Cole, to show that British complicity with Brazilian slavery, although perhaps not widespread, was more complex and diverse than the literature currently suggests. So with these broad aims of my project in mind, I'd like now to turn to the specifics of this case study, this bank. Um, we'll start with its origins and discuss how on earth it ended up owning a commercial bank, ended up owning a coffee plantation in the interior of Sao Paulo. The London Brazilian Bank, as many of you might know, was established in 1862 and had a long and largely successful history in Brazil. The tree graphic here shows its evolution in the 20th century as part of Lloyd's, a bank which continued to have a presence in Brazil until 2003 when its operation, some of its operations there were sold to HSBC. There was an earlier divestment in, in, in the 80s. David Jocelyn's official history of the bank assures, shows us, informs us that by as early as 1880, the London and Brazilian had become the most, foreign, most important foreign bank in the country. However, this was only achieved after an initial turbulent period, so a series of mismanagement and financial crises threatened the bank's very existence as a going concern. Central to these tumultuous beginnings was the Angelica Plantation, and the Angelica Plantation account, which according to Jocelyn was, quote, one of the bank's major encumbrances of its early operations and a reminder of the perils of Brazilian banking. End quote. The bank's involvement with plantation agriculture is somewhat surprising given the strictly commercial focus outlined in its articles of association. However, the backgrounds of some of its board members suggest they were well aware of the profits that could be made directly from the coffee trade. Two examples are particularly interesting. Firstly, Edward Johnson, who sat on the board from the bank's inception until 1876, was long established in Brazil and by 1870, his company was the largest exporter, second largest exporter of Brazilian coffee. I'm sure we'll hear more from Bob Greenhill this afternoon on that. Secondly, we know from UCL's legacies of British slave ownership project 
that the board's chairman and driving force behind the bank's establishment, John White Cater, was a coffee plantation owner in Jamaica, and alongside fellow board member John Bloxham Ellen, was awarded compensation following the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Here are the, uh, the, the claims of the two gentlemen, um, both resident planters in Jamaica, I believe. The first accounts and annual reports reflect the promising start the bank made in Brazil. In its first three years of trading, the bank had expanded ne its network of branches, increased capitalization, and was able to offer shareholders dividends of around 8% on paid up capital. The annual report of 1865 stated that business was progressing, it was progressing most satisfactorily, and through caution and prudence, they had emerged largely unscathed from the 1864 Soto crisis, which had shaken Rio's financial community. However, reports from the following years make it clear that the bank's management in Rio had not been as prudent as the board had stated, and in the aftermath of the Over and Gurney crisis in 1866, and the ongoing Paraguayan war, the bank was beset with a serious problem related to locked up capital in Rio. The chairman had initially feared that these lock ups could amount to a substantial £900,000, but by 1868 stated that that figure was somewhat closer to a still considerable £400,000. Over half of this amount was due to the failure in late 1865. <coughs> of Vergedo y Compañía, a private banking house in the province of Sao Paulo, headed by the commander José Vergedo. The company had extensive interests in coffee planting and brokerage, colonization schemes, the import-export business, and even road construction. Contrary to most secondary sources, the court records I've been looking at show the bank had not directly extended a £200,000 loan to Vergedo, but instead held promissory notes that were discounted from another private bank in Sao Paulo Gavion, Hibedo, Gavion. Either way, this is a significant divergence from the bank's stated preference for short-term mercantile business, as the loan had originally been secured by a mortgage on two plantations, the 400 or so slaves who worked them, and according to the chairman, no timescale had been clearly defined for its repayment. The board blamed this divergence on the mismanagement by officers in Rio and sought to remedy the problem by sending a special mission from London to negotiate the recovery of the outstanding balance, the equivalent of 35% of paid up capital in 1868 and around £11 million in today's money. The extent of this exposure left the bank in a precarious position. Dividends were suspended in 1868 and only resumed in 1873 following the reconstruction of the bank a reconstruction which had largely been the result of this outstanding Vergedo debt. With so much at stake, the success of the special mission, headed by the bank's London secretary, John Beaton, was vital. On his first visit in 1868, it appears that he rejected an initial pence-in-the-pound offer by the estate's liquidator, although I'm still not clear on the exact amount. Instead, Beaton preferred to wait for the conclusion of a two-year grace period to foreclose on the mortgage of the Angelica estate. This would cover half the outstanding debt and he arranged a six part repayment schedule secured by the second estate for the remaining 50%. So now we've established the circumstances in which the bank took ownership of this plantation. The next part of the presentation will look at an overview of the administration of Angelica, the bank's clear commitment to and various experiments with free labor and how ultimately the employment of slave labour on the plantation ran contrary to the moral standards, if not legal obligations, about the bank itself recognised were part of the identity of a British company operating in Brazil. By May 1871, the Fazenda Angelica had been transferred to the bank. It was now in control of a vast plantation complex located the north of the modern city of Rio Claro and the west of the then province of Sao Paulo. By the 1850s, the west of Sao Paulo was the fastest growing region in Brazil in both terms of wealth and population, driven by the as it was driven by the expansion of the coffee economy, which remained Brazil's engine of growth from 1830 to well into the 20th century. By 1870, Rio Claro was at the centre of this expansion and home to various coffee plantations, of which Angelica, at 100 kilometres squared, was the largest by some distance. Hope the map that on the left indicates that's not too clear, but they are the, the other plantations in the, in the region of Rio Claro. Like the vast majority of plantations in Brazil's coffee axis, 
Hugh wealth in the 1870s was largely based on the exploitation of slave labour. Following the abolition of the transatlantic trade, the high profitability of coffee meant that, in spite of increasing slave prices, planters in the centre south could afford to purchase slaves from the stagnating sugar and coffee plantations of the northeast. The inter, but also the intra, provincial trades led to a remarkable regional and sectoral redistribution of Brazil's slave population and meant that, at least in the short term, slavery continued to provide the most profitable and, for most planters, the preferred system of labour. Interestingly, though, the Angelica plantation, as well as the other Vegedo plantation at Ibicaba, had actually been the site of some of the very first experiments with large-scale free labour on plantations in Brazil. The contracting of European immigrants on sharecropping schemes had been pioneered by Senador Nicolau Vegedo, the father of the current debtor, in the 1840s and 50s, but had failed to overhaul labour relations in the region. Indeed, the mortgage contracts I've been looking at make clear that whilst pockets of European colonists remained on the Angelica and Ibicaba plantations, large numbers of slaves were employed still there in 1866, 134 in the case of Angelica and 284 on Ibicaba. The use of slave labour, then, would not be a feature of the early years of the bank's administration of the plantation. The bank decided to commence operations with a completely free labour force and would do so by replicating many of the features of the coloniz colonisation schemes undertaken by the Vergado family. However, in recognition of the difficulties in, in administrating an estate and a settler colony from the real branch of the bank, the management in London opted to establish a third party company in which it would retain a majority interest to purchase and manage the estate. In April 1872, the Brazilian Coffee Estates Company was incorporated in London. The company's commitment to free labour was formalised with a contract with the Brazilian government which outlined ambitious plans to establish a colony of 10,000 European immigrants on Angelica. These immigrants would work to increase the productive area of the coffee plantation tenfold to 30 kilometres squared. This considerable expansion would, according to the company's prospectus anyway, eventually lead to an annual production of 4,500 tonnes of coffee and would allow for a yearly dividend of 20% on the £250,000 in nominal capital. Despite early optimism, by late 1872, the Coffee Estates Company had failed to raise the re capital required and the bank was left to administer the plantation directly. Nevertheless, it decided to progress with plans for a German settler colony, but because of Brazil's poor reputation as a destination, by 1873, it only managed to send 203 Germans to the estate. Still, the bank's director seemed optimi optimistic. At the 1873 AGM, the chairman stated that, quote, they were sending out picked emigrants and treating them liberally, and he believed that when they had sufficient to work it thoroughly, it would become very profitable, end quote. The arrival of these immigrants coincided with the appointment of a new plantation administrator, Alexander Scott Blackwell, a native of Aberdeenshire and a veteran of the coffee industry in the British colony of Ceylon. Remember that name as he pops up uh, and during the rest of the presentation. Local newspapers and judicial records suggest his arrival marked the beginning of a period of unrest, disorder and discontent amongst the plantation workers. During the period 1873 to 1876, there were a series of allegations of mistreatment, a mass expulsion from the estate, riotous behaviour and even two murders, one of a German colonist and one of a Scottish manager following an altercation with a worker. This volatile environment led to the intervention of the German vice consul, the municipal authorities, as well as the chief of police and resulted in two of the British managers being sentenced to 12 months in jail. Complaints arising from the Angelica plantation and other German colonies in this region, um, I'm thinking here of the Indiatuba uh, and Sao Chinu plantations, eventually led to the Prussian government banning emigration to Brazil. So with the supply of migrants cut off and, an abs and ab the absconding of recent arrivals, a sympathetic visit at the plantation in 1876 declared the German settler colony to be a failure. Both he and Blacklow, in a letter from 1878, attributed the failure to the deceitful nature of the colonists, their unsuitability for agricultural labour, and the destabilising effect of neighbouring planters. Whilst these reasons may have contributed, 
The secondary literature on similar immigrant sharecropping ventures in Brazil at this time supports the view that the scheme failed primarily due to the inability of the managers to deal with free labourers on a contractual basis without resorting to extra economic coercion or negative work incentives. In the Brazilian planters case, this was a product of the patriarchal and authoritarian practices inherent in slavery, though I'd argue in Blacklow's case, similar conduct may more accurately reflect the norms of Indian indentured labour in Ceylon. Alongside the remaining German workers were an undefined number of free Brazilian day labourers, or camaradas. It's un it, but it's certainly clear from Blacklow's correspondence that he never re really regarded them as a central solution to the labour demands of the plantation. He stated, quote, he will, the camarada will submit to no regular discipline, only works when he likes, however much his absence may inconvenience his employer, is very difficult to obtain and seldom can be got unless under heavy advance. The unwillingness of local free men and women to sell their labour on coffee plantations was clearly due to the degradation of labour relations caused by slavery, but in their case in particular was also related to the alternative survival strategies available along Brazil's sparsely populated coffee frontier. So, unable to attract sufficient numbers of free Brazilian labourers from the local area, the estate's managers again turned to a solution from further afield. From the few sources available, it seems that the bank was one of the pioneering partners in a scheme promoted by the then Minister of Agriculture, the Barão de Sinumbu, to subsidise the, the migration of hundreds of labourers from the drought-stricken region of Ceará in the northeast of the country. In the end, anywhere between 200 and 600 Ciarenses were brought to Angelica between 1877 and 1880, but I suspect the number which remained to work on the plantation was perhaps towards the lower end, given that Black Law continued to search for other labour solutions during this period. It's interesting that this scheme had some notable similarities to indentured, indentured migration flows in the Indian Ocean, which of course Black Law had witnessed during his time there. In fact, Blacklow not only hoped to replicate the many feature, the features of Indian indentured labour in Brazil, he actually believed it was a credible solution to the labour problems he and other planters had been facing. It's in this context that in July of 1878, Blacklow, as a special guest of Sinumbu, made a speech at the Agricultural Congress in Rio, outlining his view of Brazil's labour problems. Recounting his experience on the coffee plantations in Ceylon, Blacklow sought to convince the assembled audience of Brazil's planter elite that, quote, the Indian coolie is therefore the race which, with more advantages than whites, suits our agriculture. It is this race which we need for the service on our plantations, end quote. In a lengthy and often technical speech, the bank's manager made a high-profile intervention into an already fiercely debated question around whether Asian, and particularly Chinese, labour could provide a transitory solution to Brazil's perceived labour problem. Although he was likely unaware, Blacklow's intervention was in direct conflict with British anti-slavery interests in Brazil. At the very same time, British officials in the foreign, India and colonial offices were working to prevent such schemes from materialising. Indeed, in earlier research, um, my must unpublished master's dissertation, I've shown how the only project of this kind, involving the arrival in 1877 of 200 Indians to a sugar plantation owned by the, Visc the Viscount Mawa, was opposed by British officials who employed anti-slavery rhetoric to ensure that this small-scale experiment could not be replicated in future. So, so far we've seen how the bank experimented, often at great expense, with various forms of free labour. Whilst this initial commitment to large-scale free labour <coughs> was likely to have been driven in part by an economic rationale, reports from the bank's AGMs throughout the 1870s show a clear link between this decision and the moral, if not perceived, legal obligations it had as a British company. Um, three statements on, I'll, I'll read them out for the people who probably can't see them. <coughs> uh, this is the chairman in 1870, the AGM in 1874, quote, the difficulty with regard to labour was that they could not hold, hold slaves, which was hardly desirable, end quote. 1879, there had been some difficulty in working one of the estates as the bank could not own slaves, end quote. And 1880, perhaps the most explicit, being an English company, the bank could not employ slaves, end quote. In spite of these statements made to shareholders, from local sources and the bank's own correspondence, 
It's clear from that at least 1877 to the sale of the plantation in 1881, hired slave labour was employed, at least at intermittent periods, on the Angelica estate. The bank's archives show that this decision was authorised on more than one occasion by the bank's London headquarters, and although the chairman would reference their inability to own or employ slaves, it's likely that he was well aware before 1880, the 1881 AGM when he stated, quote, the Angelica estate had been sold on advantageous terms and the bank now had not a single slave in its employment, end quote. Although I've so far been unable to define the number of slaves on the estate during this period, letters written by a visit at the plantation give us, give us a clue to the possible source of this labour, as he references the profits being made by a group of American Confederate immigrants in the area who hired out the services of their slaves to planters who were unable to purchase their own, quote, such as the Englishman, end quote. Chris Evans has shown that the hiring of slaves was a method used by British mining companies in Brazil to circumvent the 1843 law which prohibited British subjects and companies anywhere in the world to, quote, deal or trade in, purchase, sell, barter or transfer slaves. Although the bank had found a way of not technically falling foul of British anti-slavery legislation, it's clear from the initial commitment to free labour and the contradictory nature of the public and private correspondence that the director saw the use of slaves by a British company as morally questionable at the very least. Only further archival research will clarify the extent to which slave labour was employed by the British managers of the Angelica estate. However, it's already clear that the bank's entanglement with Brazilian slavery is more complex than the hiring of gangs of slaves to work their coffee plantation. The 1881 statement made by the chairman declared that the bank no longer had a single slave in its employment, but a decision regarding the sale of the plantation meant the bank continued to have a clear vested financial interest in the lives of enslaved men and women until abolition in 1888. Unable to pay the asking price in full, the purchaser of the Angelica estate, the Barão de Grau Mogol, asked to mortgage his 80 slaves in order to finance the outstanding balance of the purchase, an offer which the bank's directors accepted seemingly without question. In fact, the bank's directors voiced their satisfaction that the Baron would be able to manage the property properly with his enslaved labour force and thus be able to afford the loan repayments. Nevertheless, the bank's debt to the bank continued to mount, and if we had to believe him, the loan contract was the reason why he was unable to free his slaves at any point before abolition in May 1888. Ongoing research suggests that this form of entanglement was not unique in the bank's early history. Court records and other sources make it clear that the bank held other mortgages secured by slave property and on occasion forced the sale of enslaved men, women and children to recover outstanding debts. The red points on this map here um, indicate where the bank held mortgages secured by slave property. Uh, the number of slaves uh, involved in, in these sort of transactions could range from one, in the case of a merchant company in Rio de Janeiro, a slave called Paulo, to upwards of 300 uh, slaves in a, on a property in, right in the interior of Sao Paulo, it's Sao Carlos. Uh, the, the only one case I've really had time to analyse so far is uh, the debt of a, a, a Baron Barão de Turvo in the Piraí region of Rio de Janeiro, so um, quite close to the city there, um, where the bank forced the sale of 130 of his slaves um, to pay the outstanding um, balance on his current account. Uh, more research needs to be done on this. Um, it's very fresh. Um, but uh, it's quite possible that this business practice not only ran contrary to British anti-slavery identity, but was also illegal under anti-slavery legislation. So uh, just putting that point out there, cause, um, I would appreciate the help of any legal scholars in the room if, uh, if anyone is here, but this is something I'm, I'm, I'm currently working on going forward. So just to wrap up then, the labour history of the Angelica Plantation and my ongoing research into loans and mortgages secured by slave property clearly show the dissonance between British business interests and British anti-slavery identity reverberated beyond the mining exclaves, the British mining exclaves in Minas Gerais. The exploitation of labour and the nominal economic value of enslaved men and women 
by the London Brazilian Bank stands alongside the well-known mining case studies to challenge the traditional characterization of Britain and the British as staunch proponents of the global anti-slavery crusade. However, I'd argue that it also stands apart to highlight, uh, apart from these, the, the mining case studies, to highlight that this dissonance is more complex and diverse than previously assumed, and I'm alluding here to, particularly to my ongoing research into, into loans and mortgages. Finally, I hope that this presentation has shown that in order to understand the meanings of British anti-slavery in Brazil in the 19th century, we must consider all British interests with a stake in Brazilian labour, not just the official mind of the anti-slavery state. Thank you.